right, well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the joint seminar, uh, joint colloquium. Um, I'm glad to see the big crowd. Uh, the speaker, David Harvey, is well known to us all. Um, so he will tell us about his recent breakthrough on e integer multiplications. Okay, thank you very much, Lee. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Melina for suggesting that I give like this talk. And, uh, it's actually better. Sorry, it's better? Actually okay, better. sorry, it's better. Um, and Daniel and Josh for organizing the uh, video. And uh, also, of course, my collaborator, uh, Joris van der Herman, um, who can't be here because uh, he's just outside Paris, I suppose. Um, we've written, I think, about 10 papers together in the last five years, um, pretty much all of them about multiplying big numbers together. Um, so this is just the next one. Um, so here's the basic problem. Um, I give you two large integers with n bits, and your job is to compute the product of those integers, which generally will have about two n bits. Um, so you, bits means digits in binary, you can work in any base you want, base 10 is fine, doesn't really make a difference. Um, so I'm interested in the computational complexity of this problem. So I'm going to write uh, m of n for the uh, time, so the number of uh, bit operations needed to multiply these integers. Um, now if I was going to be uh, very careful and formal about this, I would, I would choose a particular complexity model. So in our paper we work with, with multi-tape Turing machines, which is pretty standard in computer science. Um, another popular model would be Boolean circuits, so just counting the number of logic gates in the circuit that, that computes this product. Um, but for this talk, I don't want to get I don't want to get caught up in these technical details. Just just your intuitive notion of bit operations, of logical operations on single bits. It's really all I'm talking about. So um, we all learned this at primary school. This is long multiplication, also called the classical multiplication algorithm or the school book algorithm, and it's a quadratic time algorithm. Okay, the amount of work you need to multiply two integer numbers is proportional to n squared. And you can see that on this picture, I'm multiplying uh, two numbers with n digits, and I have to multiply every digit of the first number by every digit of the second number. So that's n squared multiplications, and then I also have to do a quadratic amount of work to add up the results. Okay, so that's an O of n squared algorithm, and it's an ancient algorithm, thousands of years old. There's various different versions, but they're all basically this idea. Now, in the late 1950s, the famous Soviet mathematician Andrei Kolmogorov conjectured that this is the best you can do. Okay? But this, this big theta means um, it's an upper and a lower bound, up to a constant. Um, so long multiplication is asymptotically optimal. And I, I guess his reason for, for thinking this is that people have been multiplying numbers for a long time. And if there was a better way to do it, then someone would have noticed by now. Okay, so it's a dangerous argument. Um, so he was wrong, which is, which is great for me, because just about everything I've ever worked on relies on the fact that you can multiply faster than quadratic time. Um, so of course, Karatsuba in 1962, just a few years after Kolmogorov had proposed his conjecture, um, gave a subquadratic bound, so around n to the 1.58. It's a very, very cute algorithm. And chances are someone's phone in this room is using Karatsuba as we speak very commonly used algorithm. Um, then uh, this was uh, generalized and improved during the 60s, and the, the best result along these lines that I'm aware of um, is an algorithm of, of Knuth. Um, in fact, he doesn't, actually, uh, he doesn't actually write down the proof of this. He gives it as a series of exercises in um, The Art of Computer Programming, Volume 2. Um, you have to go back, I think, to the first edition, maybe the second, but probably just the first. Um, anyway, I've done the exercises, and I, it's not that easy to convince myself that this is, this is what you get. So you can see, you, you get the n, that's not surprising. Now, now this factor is like x of square root of log n. Now that factor grows more slowly than any fixed power of n. Okay, so you, you, get, you get an algorithm which is n to the 1 plus epsilon, for any positive epsilon. But it also grows much more rapidly than any fixed power of log n. Okay, so this algorithm it's certainly nowhere near n log n, and it's, it's not even n times a fixed power of log n. Okay, so a big breakthrough happened at the end of the 60s. Um, the fast Fourier transform was published, although it was actually known to Gauss in the early 1800s, but it wasn't written down. Uh, so um, then after they did this, uh, very, very shortly after this, Schoenhagen and Strassen pointed out you can multiply integers using the, the fast Fourier transform. And they gave this, this famous bound n log n times log log n. But they felt that the log log n factor was a bit artificial, shouldn't really be there. And they thought that the right answer should be n log n. 
This was their conjecture. Um, this paper is in German. My German is not fantastic, but I'm pretty sure that what they were saying was that there should be an n log n algorithm, and that is the best you could possibly do. Right? That was their conjecture. Now, nothing happened for 36 years, which is a very long time for a problem like this. Um, well, I guess various things happened. I was born, for example, that was important to me. Um, but then, in 2007, so I guess towards the end of my uh, PhD, um, Martin Fuhrer came up with this, this better algorithm, which was a great shock. I mean, this, was, this had a huge psychological impact, I think, the fact that you could do better than this thing that had stuck around for 36 years. So what did he do? Um, he replaced the log log n by this function, k to the log star n, so k here is some constant. He didn't bother figuring out the constant, but you could figure it out if you wanted to. Um, the log star n is the iterated logarithm. It's a very, very slowly growing function. So here's the definition. So basically what you do is you take the number n and you take log of that. And if it's still pretty big, you take log again. And you just keep taking log until you've bashed it down to 1. And you count the number of times you took log. Okay, that's log star n. So very, very slowly growing function. It's very hard to think of numbers where log star is more than about 3. The brain just explodes. Okay, so, you know, I think most mathematicians are trained to think of log log n as a very slowly growing function. So when you're working in this field, log log n feels like a very quickly growing function. It diverges to infinity almost instantaneously, whereas this is a, a more reasonably paced function. Okay, the log <laughs> so I got involved in this game about five years ago. Um, so I wrote a paper with, with Joris and with Grégoire Lasser, where we gave Another algorithm, a bit like Führer's, a bit different, um, which um, also achieves this, the same sort of bound. We, we were the first to give it an explicit value for k. k equals 8 was what we got. And then there was a lot of work bashing that down to k equals 4 with some conditional results along the way. So conditional on existence of various uh, primes of special forms. And um, some people in this audience may have seen me give talks about some of these papers over the last few years. Um, and then I have to confess that when we presented this result at the ANTS conference last year, we actually already knew about the next result, but we sort of were not completely sure and have not worked out all the details. So anyway, the next result, which is what I want to talk about today, is in fact, we can get n-log. Okay, so this is the upper bound part of the schoenhauer strassen conjecture. The lower bound is, I think, a lot harder. Um, so, of course, if their conjecture is correct, then this is optimal. You can't do better except by possibly a constant factor. Okay. But, I want to remind the audience what happened to Kolmogorov's conjecture and the fact that what's our reason for thinking that n log n is the best you can do? Pretty much. Well, we've been trying for a while, right? Um, there are some partial results, there are some conditional lower bounds, there are some lower bounds if you make more assumptions about the computational model, but honestly I don't find them all that convincing altogether. Anyway, that's a, that's a much harder problem. Now, I, I want to issue a warning. This paper has not been peer-reviewed yet. Um, normally, I don't bother to mention this. I often give talks about papers that have not been officially peer-reviewed. Um, it's just there's been a lot of media attention about this work, a lot of people getting very excited, and I just want to make this clear as often as I can. Um, so, take it with a grain of salt. Um, here is here's the peer review we have, the, the sum total of peer review we have received so far. Um, so there was an article in New Scientist about, about our paper um, a few weeks ago, and they asked um, Joshua Cooper, I don't know this guy, he's at the University of South Carolina, uh, what he thought, he was very excited and said, looks great. He said, um, it passes the smell test. <laughs> <laughs> so our paper smells okay, but we don't know if anyone has really read it. Um, and this, I mean, people have read it, but there's a lot of technical details that have to go right. Okay, so I'm still a bit nervous. <coughs> now, regarding the, um, all the, the media attention, I just wanted to briefly uh, tell you about the highlights for me of this craziness the last month. It's been quite amusing. Um, so I was asked to write an article for The Conversation. And uh, as you know, The Conversation is for a general audience, not, a, not even a scientific audience. Um, and on ABC News, so the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, um, it made it to second place for a few hours on their most popular articles list. Now, I'm fully aware that popularity is measured by how awesome the headline is. 
I didn't write the headline, How My Hack Could Change Multiplication Forever. I have to thank the, uh, some ABC sub-editor for that. Um, I never quite dislodged the uh, Optus Catfish. <laughs> Anyone remember the Optus Catfish? I, I have no idea what that was about because I, I never clicked on it. <laughs> I, was, I was too busy clicking on this one. <laughs> um, but I did do better than the uh, David Attenborough and his you know, Warusses falling off the cliff. So, somewhere between catfish and Morusses. The second one was um, I was interviewed live on Triple J of all places um, on Ben and Liam's breakfast show, um, and I got to talk about logarithms on Triple J. So that's possibly the first time logarithms have ever been discussed on Triple J, probably the last time. Um, it was a lot of fun, and uh, you can get a recording of that on my website. Just two or three minutes. Okay, so that's enough of that fun. Um, so now I'll get to some mathematics. So here's an outline of the talk. I'll start by reminding everyone about discrete Fourier transforms and fast Fourier transforms. Then I'll talk about the first Schoenager-Strassen algorithm, not the one that got that bound I showed you before. There's another algorithm in the same paper because it's a really good warm-up for uh, the new algorithm. Then I'm going to talk a bit about multidimensional discrete Fourier transforms, and this is really a key part of the new algorithm is working with multidimensional transforms. Then I'll have a first go at what this new algorithm, what, what I want it to look like, but we're going to run into a problem, and I'm going to solve this problem with this Gaussian reset. And then, depending on if I have some time, maybe a few comments at the end. Okay, so discrete Fourier transforms and fast Fourier transforms. So let me remind you about the definition. So T is going to be the transform length. This is a positive integer. And uh, zeta is going to be the primitive t root of unity in the complex numbers. So all my Fourier transforms in this talk will be over the complex numbers. Um, so, for instance, 2 to the pi i over t. Now, if I have a vector in CT, so just a vector of complex numbers, T complex numbers, I can define um, its discrete Fourier transform, which I'll denote by U hat. By this formula, I just take some linear combination of the U's with certain weights. So maybe I'll just give a quick example. Here's a discrete Fourier transform for T equals 4. So I have an input vector is U0, U1, U2, U3, and the output vector is U0 hat up to U3 hat, and this is explicitly the formula for the, for the u hat. So, for example, u1 hat is u0 plus i times u1 plus i squared times u2 plus i cubed times u3. Okay, so it's just a linear map over c. Now, I want to give you two equivalent ways of thinking about discrete Fourier transforms. So, the first way is um, it's basically evaluating a polynomial at the teeth roots of u. Okay, so here, here are my, my u's, are the coefficients of my polynomial f of x. And the discrete Fourier transform is just you, you, take, you take that polynomial and you evaluate it at the, the teeth roots of unity around the unit cycle. So it's just evaluating a polynomial. So that's one way of thinking about it. If you're an algebraist, you might prefer this way. Um, you're thinking of your polynomial f as being in this quotient ring, cx modulo x to the t minus 1. This is the polynomial whose roots are those teeth roots of unity. Um, and there is an isomorphism. This is really just the Chinese remainder theorem for polynomials going from this, this quotient ring to this direct sum of quotient rings. And each of these factors is, of course, just a copy of C. So as, as a ring, it's just, it's just C of the T. So the, the discrete Fourier transform is basically evaluating this map, going from the, the monomial basis over here to this sort of evaluation basis on, on this side. And then the inverse discrete Fourier transform is going back the other way. Now, what about computing discrete Fourier transform? Um, well, if you do it in the naive way, what do I mean by the naive way? If I, if I go back to the formula here, you just, you just evaluate this for each k separately. Okay? You just plug in the numbers and, and compute this. Um, so then you need um, O of t squared operations. Now here I'm not, I'm not counting bit operations now. I'm counting uh, algebraic operations in the complex numbers. So I'm working an algebraic complexity model. Um, so you need O of t squared operations. Basically for each of the t outputs you need to do t operations, O of t operations to compute u hat k. Now the fast Fourier transform um, improves this from t squared to t log t. Okay, now I'm not going to explain um, how the FFT works, I don't have time for that. Um, <laughs> so if you already know why there's a butterfly on the screen, then you already know about the FFT. And if you don't know why there's a butterfly on the screen, then 
well, it's still a nice picture of butterfly, you can enjoy it. Um, and you can go afterwards, you can read about the FFT and see why there's a butterfly. <coughs> now, um, what's the point of the FFT? What does it have to do with multiplication? Well, it's, it's very closely related to multiplication. So here's an algorithm that computes the product of two polynomials using the FFT. So suppose I'm given polynomials f and g of degree less than t. So what do I do? I first use the fast Fourier transform to evaluate my two polynomials at those, those teeth roots of unity on the unit circle. So now I've got t values of f and t values of g. Then I multiply the corresponding values at each of those t points. So what does that give me? It gives me the value of the product of those polynomials at those t points. And then I use the inverse FFT to interpolate, to compute the polynomial that has those values at those t points. Now, what, what do you get? You don't quite get the product. You get the product modulo x to the t minus 1. Okay? Because you've only, you've only got information about the product at the, at the roots of this, this polynomial. Um, so another way to think about it, um, you know, if you're a signal processing sort of person, is you're computing the convolution of the, the coefficient sequence. It's a cyclic convolution of length t. You're, you're letting the coefficients wrap around on a, on a vector of length t. Um, so the total cost of this procedure I've just described is O of t log t operations, because you needed t log t in step 1 and step 3, and step 2 was just O of t. Okay, so that's, that's polynomial multiplication. Okay, so now we'll explain the first schoenberg strassen algorithm. So as I mentioned before, there are, there are two <coughs> algorithms in their paper, and the, the more famous one is the second one, which achieves this bound, which, which was the record holder for 36 years. I'm going to explain the other one, which the complexity is slightly worse, um, but it's a good warm-up for the new algorithm. Okay, so I, I've given, we're given two integers, u and v, with n bits. And the first thing I'm going to do is chop them up into little chunks. Okay, chunks of size about log n. Okay, so b is going to be my, my chunk size, and that's going to be exponentially smaller than n. So lots and lots of little chunks. And I'm going to encode those chunks as the coefficients of these polynomials, f and g. They're going to have integer coefficients being those chunks. So let me, let me start up a, a running example here, which I'm going to do in decimal. So I, I just asked my computer to generate two random million digit numbers. So u and v each have a million digits. I'm just showing the first ten digits and the last ten digits, and I've left out a few digits in the middle. By the way, it's very curious, these digits here, 228182. Okay, 182882. Has so anyone actually checked if this thing is normal? It's very suspicious. Anyway, um, so I'm going to do this. I'm doing this in decimal, not binary. So I, I need to uh, use 10 to the 5 instead of 2 to the 5. So I split them up into chunks of, in this case, 5 digits. So my b is like 5. Okay, so there's one coefficient, the next coefficient, and so on. So these, these two polynomials have degree roughly uh, 200,000, which is a million divided by 5. And, um, so they, and, and they satisfy this property. U is just F evaluated at 10 to the 5. So. so that's the first step. Break them up into chunks. Second step is multiply the polynomials using fast Fourier transforms. Now what you do is you forget that the polynomials have integer coefficients. You now just think of them as having complex coefficients. And you multi multiply them as complex polynomials. And then if you, do, if you maintain enough working precision through the calculation, then your result Will be, will be close enough to an integer that you can just round to the nearest integer to get the correct result. So you have to prove something about the, the error propagation during the calculation. So you now run an example. Here's the product of the two polynomials, which has integer coefficients. And you can see um, the degree is roughly double. It's about 400,000, because these polynomials are now twice as long. And the coefficients are also larger as well. Right? These coefficients are about twice the size of the original polynomial, because you have to multiply two coefficients together. Um, this is actually a bit misleading because if you look in the middle of this polynomial at around x to the 200,000, the coefficients will be bigger again because you're adding up lots of coefficients to get those ones. Right? But they might be only, say, three times bigger. That's why we chose the log n size coefficients. Now, I want to stress, um, during the FFT, um, as I said before, you need to uh, maintain some extra bits of precision. It turns out that O of log n bits is enough for your precision. So I guess if, if, you, if you're used to doing this on a computer, you normally think of your precision as, as fixed by the hardware, right? You have 53-bit floating point, for example. Um, but here, remember that n could be, much, could be much, much, much bigger than this. 
and it might be so large that your, your, your coefficients don't fit into single machine words anymore, they, they can become arbitrarily big in this big complexity model. So you have to worry about the cost of doing arithmetic during the FFT, multiplying all the complex numbers that show up during the FFT. And every time you do a multiplication of those coefficients, you have to reduce that to integer multiplication and then use the whole algorithm recursively to handle those small coefficient multiplications. So we'll see the effect of this in a few moments. Okay, and then finally, the last step is easy uh, to, to, um, to get the, the product as an integer. You just take that polynomial that we just computed and you plug in, in this case, x is 10 to the 5. And what that does is it just sort of it, it adds up these coefficients with, with some overlap. So you can see, for example, the, 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 high, the top half of this coefficient ends up here. The bottom half of this coefficient ends up in the next five digits, but you also get some overlap from the, the top of this coefficient here. Okay, so that, that gets added to there, and it's, it's all very easy to, to add everything up. You can do that in linear time to get the, the product, which is now about two million digits. All right. So that was a, a, a very brief explanation of the first shunning stress and algorithm, and I can give a very, very quick complexity analysis. Um, it turns out you've reduced an n-bit multiplication problem to a large number of log n, O of log n-bit multiplication problems. It turns out there are O of n of them. So you get this recurrence, m of n is O of n times m of log n, and then you use the algorithm recursively. So now m of log n becomes log n times m of log log n, and then you get a log log n factor, and then you'll get a log 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 n factor, and you'll, you'll keep getting more logs. And you can see already this is worse than the n log n log log n. I've got this extra stuff that keeps happening. And the other reason this algorithm is not so famous is it's just very hard to write down this complexity bound. Whereas n log n log log n is, is very nice. Okay, so that's all I want to say about that um, first Schoenig stress algorithm. Let's now talk about multidimensional Fourier transforms. So now, instead of a one-dimensional transform of length t, I'm going to work with a d-dimensional transform. So in this picture, d is 3. Um, and I've got different transform lengths, t1, t2, t3, all at right angles to each other. And I need to work with arrays. So d-dimensional arrays of complex numbers of this size. Um, so technically it's a, it's a tensor product. I'm just going to write it like this. C with these superscripts t1 up to, to td. So let me define what the discrete Fourier transform of such an array is. Um, so I've given some array u. Um, I need a, a root of unity for each dimension. So z to 1, z to 2, z to 3, and so on of, of the correct order. And the DFT is, is defined using exactly the same formula. Um, it's now giving me an array so of, of the same size. So you give me U with an array of some size, then the discrete Fourier transform that you have is another array of the same size. So again, you can interpret this as evaluating polynomials. <coughs> but now we're working with multivariate polynomials. So here's a polynomial D variables, uh, uh, F. And its coefficients are just this array of coefficients corresponding to all the various monomials. And the discrete Fourier transform is exactly the same. You just evaluate f, um, each of the variables. You evaluate all the various powers of those, those roots of unity. So that's equivalent to the definition I, I wrote down a moment ago. And then from the algebraic point of view, we're now thinking of polynomials modulo these, these cyclic uh, polynomials in each dimension. So what this means is is multiplying these polynomials um, is a d-dimensional cyclic convolution. Okay, so you multiply the polynomials and then you, you sort of cycle around in the t1 direction, the t2 direction, and so on. Now, again we've got this question, how do you evaluate a discrete Fourier transform in d-dimensions? So let me first show you the, the most obvious way to do it, um, is you just do one-dimensional transforms in each dimension. All right, so so, for example, if you're doing a transform of a three-dimensional transform, then what you have to do is, first of all, you transform everything in the t1 direction, and the number of those transforms is, is t2 times t3. And then you transform everything in the t2 direction, and then you transform everything in the t3 direction. And you can do these three steps in any order. They, they all commute with each other. And if you look at the total cost of this procedure, you get the following. You get t1, t2, t3 times log of t1, t2, t3. That's the total number of operations, assuming you use fast Fourier transforms in, in all, the, all the three dimensions. 
So what happens in general, um, it's easy to see that for a d-dimensional transform, the number of operations is t log t. Um, where t is now the total number of coefficients, it's, it's, the, it's the volume of that cube. So this, this t log t is very intrinsic to this whole setup, right? it doesn't want, doesn't want to go away. And I want to stress something about this. Um, if you look carefully at how the, how the work breaks up between additions and multiplications, you'll see that there's O of T log T addition and subtractions, and also O of T log T multiplications. Right? And this, is, this is important. <coughs> now, um, there's this um, trick due to Nussbaumer, um, which is based on, on some of what Schoenberger and Strassen did, which I want to explain. And this is where we, we start to get some idea of where the speed up might be coming from in the new algorithm. So if you look at this ring again, it's this d-dimensional cyclic convolution ring. If you look at one of these variables, say xi, um, it behaves a bit like a ti root of unity. It's not a complex ti root of unity, it's sort of an algebraic ti root of unity, right? It's, it's ti power is 1. Okay? And, there are and there are several powers of it living in this ring. There's xi, xi squared, and so on. Now, what Nussbaum has showed, I'm not going to go through all the details of this, but in some cases, not all the time, but in some cases, you can use this, this fake root of unity to speed up the transforms with respect to the other variables. Okay, so um, you might be able to use x1 to speed up the transform with respect to x2. This was his idea. And what's good about that is it's much easier to multiply by one of these fake roots of unity, this power of xi, than by an actual complex ti root of unity. If you want to multiply by a complex ti root of unity, this is something you might do during an FFT, um, you actually have to multiply complex numbers together, right? And that's hard work. Whereas multiplying by a power of xi is just rearranging the data, it's just pushing coefficients around, changing exponents. It's much easier. So there's one important special case I want to focus on, is when all the t's, all the dimensions are powers of 2. And that's the case where Nussbaumer's trick applies. Now here's what happens. It turns out you only need to do the, the genuine complex uh, FFTs in one of the dimensions. The other d minus one dimensions are much easier. You don't, you, they, they can be done entirely in terms of additions and subtractions, and, and these funny fake roots of unity, which, which don't take really any work. Um, so basically, you've, what's happened is all the hard work is happening only in one of the d dimensions. So this, this, the, the result is that um, the total number of additions and subtractions is the same as before, and it's still t log t. But we save a factor of d in the number of multiplications. I'm assuming that I've balanced all my different dimensions, so they're all about the same size. It doesn't work if one dimension is very small, one's very large. You need them all about the same size, then you save a factor of d. And, and this is the upshot, and this is really the, the, the key idea that can make this work, is by taking a large enough d, by making the dimension large enough, you can make almost all the work be additions and subtractions. If you want 99% of the work to be additions and subtractions, you just take d to be about 100. Okay? And then there are very few multiplications left. Okay, so let's let's take that idea and try to make an integer multiplication time. Okay, so I'm going to start just like Schoenhager Strassen, the algorithm I explained uh, before. So I've got my integers, I'm going to cut them into small chunks, and now I'm trying to multiply polynomials in ZX. Okay, this is a one-dimensional polynomial multiplication problem. And what I want to do is I want to somehow convert this to a d-dimensional problem for a large d. So I can take advantage of Nussbaumer's, Nussbaumer's trick. So I'm going to do something that might seem a bit strange at first, but hopefully it will become a bit clearer why I'm, why I'm doing this in a few moments. So let's choose a dimension parameter, for instance, you know, three. Three, three turns out not to be big enough, but we'll see. Let's just think about d equals three. And a bunch of primes, s1, s2, s3. Distinct primes. So I need them all to be roughly the same size, and I need their product to be just a bit bigger than the, the degree of the product that I'm trying to compute. So these, these SIs will all be about the dth root of the, the target length. Okay? I'm trying to sort of make a cube that's around the same volume as, as the length of the polynomial that I'm trying to work with. And an extra condition, I need each SI to be slightly smaller than a power of 2, which I'll call T. So here's, with, with our running example, here are some example parameters. I, I don't know if these parameters really work, but um, just for the, for the sake of illustration. So we were trying to resolve a product polynomial of degree 400,000. So I'm going to just take d equals 3, um, just to make life easy. 
and I'm going to choose three primes, 59, 61, 127. Pretty sure they're prime. Um, and I've chosen them so their product is a bit bigger than 400,000. It, it turns out to be about 457,000. I don't want it to be like, you know, several million. I want it to be maybe up to twice as big, so constant times as big. And you can see I've chosen them so that they're all smaller than, than uh, some corresponding power of 2. 64, 64, okay. Now, it's enough to compute my polynomial product modulo this polynomial. In this case, x to the 457,073. Exactly. Mi minus 1. Because I know my polynomial has degree 400,000, so if I can compute it in this ring, then, then I've got the result I want. <coughs> Okay, so now it's a, a cyclic convolution. Now, um, it was pointed out in the late 70s by Agarwal and Cooley um, that you can use the Chinese remainder theorem to rewrite this sort of convolution. You can rewrite this one-dimensional convolution as a d-dimensional convolution using the fact that the, S, the SIs are relatively prime. Um, basically, it corresponds to re rearranging the coefficients. I, I guess this is like the... the the classification theorem for finite abelian groups, right? You're using the fact that, that, that Z modulo this integer is, is isomorphic to Z modulo these, these integers, product of, of those rings. <coughs> okay, so I, I won't go into the details of how this works, but I hope, hope you can see how this, this arrangement works. Um, but I want to stress that I'm really relying on the, S, on the SIs being relatively prime. Right? This is not true if they're not. So for example, a convolution of length 32 is not equivalent to a two-dimensional convolution of size four times eight. Uh, you, can, you can play around with it, you'll see it just doesn't work. Whereas if, if you do, uh, say, 33, 33 really is equivalent to three times 11. Okay, so this lets me transport my, my problem of multiplying polynomials here over to here just by rearranging the coefficients, which is, which is fast. <coughs> and now I'm trying to, I'm trying to compute a d-dimensional convolution. So now I, I go back to what Schoenberg and Strassel were doing. What did they say? They said, Compute the, the discrete Fourier transform, multiply the transforms, and then compute the inverse Fourier transform. That's what I'm going to do. So I've reduced to the problem of computing d-dimensional discrete Fourier transforms of this, this funny size. So in our running example, I was trying to compute a three-dimensional convolution of this size, 59 times 61 times 127, and I've reduced this now to computing discrete Fourier transforms of size 59 times 61 times 127. Okay, so now we've got this multi-dimensional problem, and you say, ah, I want to apply Nussbaum's trick. Okay, but I said before I need powers of two. And in fact, this is the worst possible situation for Nussbaum's trick because you know I can't I can't use a fake 59th root of unity to help me compute a transform length 61 because 59 and 61 have nothing to do with each other. Okay, so we need something else. We need this uh, thing that we call Gaussian resampling. So I'm going to go back to the one-dimensional case for a few moments. And let's suppose we want to compute a transform length S. And S is an inconvenient length, like 59, 61, something like that. So we have this, this technique, which is, which is sort of new. I'll come back to that in a second, um, which we call Gaussian resampling which reduces this, this problem to a transform of slightly longer length, which I'll call T. And you can basically, you're pretty much free to choose T to be anything you want. So you could choose it to be, for example, a power of 2. Now, um, the advantage of this method compared to existing methods is you don't have a, a constant factor overhead, which comes up in some other methods. So if you're, if you're, familiar, if you're familiar with Bluestein's algorithm, that's a well-known way to compute a discrete for a transform with an annoying length by reducing it to transforms of, of longer lengths. Um, but you lose a factor of at least two when you do that, and probably more, um, whereas we don't lose any constant factor at all, okay? like, like one plus epsilon. And that's really important when we do this in D dimensions. Um, so we after, after we sort of figured all this out, we, we discovered this, this existing algorithm, this dark Brooklyn algorithm um, from 1993. So if there's any applied mathematicians in the audience might have run into this. Um, it's an algorithm for computing FFTs where the sample points and the frequencies are not sort of equally spaced around the circle. They're sort of moved around a bit. Um, and they, they reduce that to a normal FFT. And basically what turns out to happen is, is their algorithm is actually not good enough for us. But if you specialize their algorithm to a particular case, and then you improve it in a certain way, that's, that's how you get our Gaussian resampling. So they sort of have a, they have a common specialization. 
Um, so one, one interesting question is whether we can use our techniques to improve the dot Brooklyn argument. It's something I'd like to look into at some point. So how does it work? So we're given an input vector u um, of length s, and we want to compute u hat. So the first step is I'm going to compute this resampled vector of length t. So here's the formula, a bit mysterious looking. Um, again, this is a linear map. So each vk is a sum of the, the u's with some, with some weight. This is some sort of Gaussian uh, weighting function. Okay. And I'll just mention that this is not what I'm saying is a bit of a lie because we also need to scale the, the width of the Gaussians, but I'm going to ignore it in this talk. It makes things a bit more complicated. Um, but I'm going to show you a picture which I hope um, makes this a bit clearer what's going on. So here is the input vector u, which has length 13 in this example. Um, and you can see I've got u0 up to u12 and then u0 again. So this is really a circle. Um, and then I have my target vector v, which is length 16, which is also on a circle. And what's happening is each v is a linear combination of the u's. So let's take, for example, v5. So v5, you can see, um, is mainly, the, the main contribution of v5 is from u4. The, the thick line means that the weight is very large, close to 1. Um, there's also a small contribution from u5. There's a thin arrow there. There's actually also a contribution from, say, u3. But now it's gotten so small that I'm not even showing it on the picture. It's a very, very thin arrow going from u3 to v5, and so on. I mean, it actually comes, if you want to do this exactly, you need to use all the u's. But numerically, you only need a small number of them. Numerically, to get v5, you might need u4, u5, u3, and then you can just ignore the rest. And so that's, what's really happening is there's a sort of Gaussian curve, which is sort of sliding along this picture, and you're using it to pick up contributions from the u's down to the v's. Um, and it's this rapid Gaussian decay which is allowing us to compute the v from u very quickly. In fact, we compute it more quickly than, much more quickly than the time it takes to compute the Fourier transform. That's important. It's a negligible part of the argument. Okay, now, um, here's some interesting facts about this, this resampling process. First of all, this resampling map is injective if you impose some reasonable assumptions. You don't want s to be too close to t. So what does that mean? So I, I have s coefficients here, and then I have more coefficients at the bottom. So it's believable that it could be injective. But what I'm saying is that you can, you can sort of deconvolve these v's to recover the u's. Okay? There's no, no loss of information. And you can do it quickly as well. There's a fast algorithm for this, again using the fact that the, the Gaussian decays rapidly. Okay, so if, if, you, if you like, you can think of it as um, the matrix of this map sort of has a, a diagonal where all the values, all the large values are concentrated, and then it decays as you move away from the diagonal very quickly. So inverting it is, is not going to be that hard. And that's, that's what we proved in the paper. So that was the first step, the resampling. Um, second step is we're just going to compute the discrete Fourier transform on this v, okay, to get v hat. And this is, this is now a nice convenient length, like length 16, so very easy to compute. And now we use this fact that the Fourier transform of a Gaussian is a Gaussian, which might be in our first year problem sets in calculus, I can't remember, anyone remember? No, maybe not. Um, and then if you do a page or so of algebra, you find the following relation between the Fourier transform, between v hat and u hat. And if you stare at this formula for a few minutes, you'll see that this is exactly the same as the formula I had before, relating v and u, except for two things. First of all, there was an s squared here, it's now a t squared. And um, the coefficients have been permuted, right? So here we had j, now we've got t times j mod s. So if s and t are relatively prime, and this is just commuting the coefficients around. And the same here, this is just commuting the coefficients around. So what this means is v hat is just a resampled version of u hat. Okay, in exactly the same way as v is a resampled version of u, which is very nice. So what do you do, step three, is you just apply the deconvolution that I mentioned before to v hat to get u hat. So let me summarize all this in one commutative diagram. So you start with u. Okay, that's length s. And what we want to compute is the discrete Fourier transform of length s, but s is an annoying length, so we can't do that. So what we do is we resample the length t, then we do the discrete Fourier transform of length t, 
And then we do the deconvolution to get u hat. And there's some permutations in there as well. <coughs> and the, one of the, the key points of the paper is that this, this and this line, these arrows are cheaper to compute than, than these ones. Okay. So back to integer multiplication. Um, so I've talked about uh, Gaussian resampling in one dimension. You can also do it in d dimensions. You just sort of do it in each dimension separately. That turns out to work out. So we were trying to do a transform of this inconvenient size, S1 up to SD, but we can reduce it to a transform of size T1 up to TD. And our T's are not too much bigger than our S's, so the total data size hasn't grown very much. So in our example, and this is really quite magical when you think about it, we started with a transform of size 59 times 61 times 127, which was an annoying size, and we've reduced it to the problem of computing a slightly larger transform of size 64 times 64 times 128. And then we hit that one with Nussbaum's trick. And there we can use the fact that um, you know, this, this dimension here, I can use the fake root of unity to help me evaluate the transforms in the other dimensions. So that's the sort of broad overview of how the algorithm works. I'll just say a few words about the um, complexity bound, about the analysis. So first of all, where does the n log n come from? It mainly comes from all those additions and subtractions, the, the, the d minus 1 fast dimensions in the Nussbaumer um, FFT are contributing n log n altogether. But we're still left with those one-dimensional transforms in that last dimension. Um, so it turns out the right way to do this is to convert them back to integer multiplication problems. There are ways of converting uh, Fourier transforms back to integer multiplication problems. So in this case, the size would be roughly n to the 1 over d. So we started with size n, and now we've got uh, just one length of, of roughly the dth root of that. And, and then we just call the algorithm recursively to handle those multiplications. And this is the recurrence you get. So we're trying to multiply numbers of size n. I'm reducing to numbers of size n prime, which is about d root of n. So I'm getting this n log n term from the Nussbaumer stuff. And then this is the term you get from all the uh, recursive multiplications. Um, a lot of people have helpfully pointed out to me that this number 1728 is quite famous. I'm, I'm aware of that. Um, it turns out to be just a product of a bunch of various factors that show up in this analysis. It's, it's quite an accident. Um, the first time we wrote this out in enough detail to see what the constant was, it turned out to be 1728. And of course I burst out laughing when I saw that, and I thought, well that's going to stay. <laughs> so we made sure that whatever we did to the algorithm, it, it stayed at 1728. Um, it can be improved. If you, if, you, if you double the length of the paper, I can get it down to 8. Um, maybe even a bit better. Um, so now what we do is we choose any fixed dimension. We fix our dimension to be just bigger than this, this critical 1728, for example, 1729, which is also a famous number. Um, and then um, it's easy to prove that you get n log n from that recurrence. So another way to see that is if you look at the total cost of the FFTs at each level, of each recursion level of the algorithm, What's happening is, is that they're um, decreasing by this constant factor, d over 1728, and then when you add up the contributions from the successive recursion levels, you get um, just a geometric series and it converges. So you get O over n log n. And I'll point out that when you compare this to all the previous integer multiplication algorithms, um, the FFT cost actually increases at subsequent levels. So in Führer's algorithm, for example, he has the, the k to the log star n. The factor k is basically how much the cost of the FFT is increasing at each recursion level. And then log star n is the number of recursion levels. Um, so the only, the only exception is the, the second schoenhager stratton algorithm, where the cost of the FFT is, is n log n, but it stays at the same, same constant times n log n at each recursion level, and the number of recursion levels is log log n. That's why you get n log n times log n. So here we're actually getting a geometric series. We've got this 1728, this massive factor, but we're countering it with this factor of d, which is, which is bringing the cost back down again. <coughs> okay, final comments. I've still got a few minutes. So a lot of people have asked, um, for what value n do we win? Um, so that's the number we have in our paper, which is a bit big. Um, so that's, that's not... That's not the numbers we're multiplying, that's the number of digits in the numbers we're multiplying. Um, so it can probably be improved, but um, I, I'd like to say that I don't think that really says anything about the threshold. 
um, because, I mean, the threshold could be much bigger, it could be much smaller. I, I don't know. Um, really what you should do to answer this question sensibly, you should first of all optimize the algorithm, right? The algorithm, as it's currently written down, is optimized for making the paper as short as possible, which is already 40 something pages. Um, so, you know, if, if, you're, if you're prepared to do more work, then you can get this down a lot, and I, I think it's still very hard to say uh, when it would be existing algorithms. My, my, my best guess is that um, we would beat um, schoenhager strassen for, um, you know, sizes which are maybe astronomical, but not much bigger than astronomical, um, whatever that means. Astronomical is, I think, of like 10 to the 80. That's an astronomical number, whatever that means. Um, Führer's algorithm, I think we actually might beat it earlier, but this is all just me with a finger in the air. I really have no idea. Okay, I, I want to mention a second paper, which um, was also a lot of work, but didn't get as much attention, uh, which we released simultaneously, polynomial multiplication of finite fields in time of n log n. Um, and actually, in many ways, this is, I think, much more interesting stuff. Um, so if you take a fixed finite field, FQ, and you ask, I want to multiply polynomials of degree n, right, in this, in this ring. It's very similar to integer multiplication. You don't, you don't have carries, okay. Um, but we give an O of n log n algorithm for this problem, and we also give another O of n log n integer multiplication algorithm, which technically is actually a bit easier, because you don't have to worry about this Gaussian resampling. There's lots of annoying numerical analysis in the Gaussian resampling. This, you don't have to worry about it. The problem is, they're both conditional, these algorithms. They both depend on a conjecture. It's about the weakest conjecture that we've had to rely on so far, um, about primes and arithmetic progressions. If you're familiar with Linux theorem, we need Linux theorem to hold for an exponent that is very close to 1, like 1 plus 2 to the minus 1,000, or something stupid like that. But still not, they're still bounded, bounded away from 1. Um, and currently, the best record for Linux constant is like 5. And, and there's, there's no way we'll ever get it down to something close to one. That's, that's completely hopeless. So what we'd really like is a different approach, right? Um, so this is, I think, a very interesting open question, which I've been thinking about very hard for more than a year now, and I have made zero progress on this. Is there an unconditional of n log n multiplication algorithm for these polynomials? It's a very interesting open problem. <coughs> Now, practical applications. Um, I will just quote uh, my colleague, Frederick Johansson, um, who is an expert on high precision arithmetic. Um, he, he, he was one of the first, very first people to, to notice this paper and, and comment on it. Um, so he wrote on Reddit, the result is of extreme practical importance. Not for actually multiplying integers. As usual with these algorithms, it's probably not faster than existing algorithms for integers that can be stored in the observable universe, but for writing papers. <laughs> it has always been a hassle to write down the complexity of integer multiplication of algorithms based on integer multiplication by introducing soft denotation, little low exponents, epsilons greater than zero, iterated logarithms, and this other stuff. From now on, I can just write <laughs> And if you go and look at this thread, it's very amusing because then there's this conversation that follows um, by, by people who, who, who are having, like, it's very hard to, I mean, th th this point of view is, it's easy to explain to an audience like this, but, but for the person on the street, it's very hard to understand this, right? It's, it's a very strange thing to say, and there's a hilarious conversation after, it's like, is it a joke? Is he being sarcastic? <laughs> <laughs> it's true, right? It's true. Hit the nail on the head. And um, I'll finish with a um, final comment. So, uh, on the conversation, when, when an article appears, people can write comments. And as far as I know, it's completely random people writing comments. So I wanted to share with you my favorite. <laughs> so, so what did this person write? It's, I think it's still there. You can look it up. Um, <laughs> interesting article. Looks good, but subject to faith-based belief. <laughs> we are told there are quicker methods to multiply, but no explanation is given whatsoever as to how they work. <laughs> Result is, I do not feel informed or have had my knowledge advanced. I can't really endorse their plans because there's nothing to support them. <laughs> Wait for it. <laughs> Just like a climate change paper, <laughs> it could be true. But then again, it may not be. <laughs> Just because it says it's a mathematical paper, <laughs> well, it may or may not be. <laughs> so, I'd like to assure this audience that whether or not the maths is correct. It is a mathematical <laughs> <laughs> So, 
when, when I saw this, I was, I was sorely tempted to reply. And it, it took all of the, you know, collective exp the, the, the experience of my adult life, all the collected wisdom to, to sort of just, just, I'll just leave that. Um, some other helpful people did, did, did reply. Um, so, anyway. I've, I've, I've learned something from this. Um, that's it. Thank you very much. Questions or comments, please. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. See, when you say that you need bottles of tools which are close to your SIs, how close do you have to be? That's a good question. Um, so, it's actually a bit of a, so they don't, okay, they can't be too close. If they're too close, you get numerical analysis problems, you know, dividing by, by numbers that are too big. So you want them to be a little bit far away, um, but if they're too far away, then the, the T's get too big and you get this explosion. So um, it turns out that, um, so what do you need? I mean, you basically need, um, it's basically just a one plus epsilon sort of thing. So you, you fix your epsilon and you need your, you need your SIs to be something like, uh, let's say let's say one minus sorry uh, yeah one minus epsilon t i and I guess I need something like I don't know one minus two epsilon does this make sense I think that's all I need and the epsilon <coughs> depends um, on the dimension um, yeah I think that's all you need and it, it's pretty straightforward you can just use um, you can just use uh, an explicit form of the prime number theorem with the easiest explicit bound that you uh, that is out there and it works. Yeah, um, it's nothing like Linux. I mean, it's just it's just intervals which are pretty long actually. Yeah. yeah. So it's pretty clear there's a lot of things you pull together here, but they all seem to be sitting in the same general area that you you're in. Was the one of them that was from way outside, like the Gaussian thing? Uh, yeah, I mean that that was a huge surprise. Uh, so the, the the way it developed is we we first came up with a conditional algorithm which didn't use this resampling business. Mm. And then it was clear that what we needed is a way to get from one transform length to another. Yeah. And um, we were pursuing sort of three or four completely different crazy ideas. Um, I think the only one that actually works is the one we eventually came up with, this, this resampling stuff. None of the others, I, I, it'd be interesting if they worked, um, mainly for that polynomial case that I mentioned. It'd be great to get one of them to work for the polynomial case. Um, yeah, this resampling, um, yeah, it was a bit out of left field. Yeah. I, I, it's a bit hard to say exactly where it came from. I guess I was thinking first about trying to resample convolution problems. And you know, I, was, I, think, I think I was thinking about it from a sort of signal processing point of view. Like, how does a digital equalizer work, right? Like, an equalizer somehow shouldn't care what sampling frequency is. Can you somehow turn that into an algorithm? And somehow thinking along that line for a while eventually led to this stuff. Oh, for example, we have we have two bigger numbers, and there's only one and two. Then could you do better for this uh, special kind of numbers? Sorry, there's only one. I mean, uh, there's only one and two in this uh, digit. Uh, yeah, you have two numbers. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, this numbers f uh, that uh, forms uh, there's only one and two in this two. Numbers. Oh, the digits in the numbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So you mean instead of instead of the digits zero up to nine, I have yeah, just yeah, the digits yeah. one and two. Um, I have no idea. Um, I suspect that you can't actually do any better with that. Although it does remind me of a problem where I, I once, for, for computing some, um, some Bernoulli numbers and stuff related to Bernoulli numbers, I had to compute a Fourier transform of a signal that was all just ones and minus ones, which is very similar to that. And I think I was able to save maybe a constant factor, a small constant factor. But certainly, I don't think you'll do better than, than n log n even for those sorts of numbers. I think they look pretty random from the point of view of this sort of algorithm. Actually, you said there, there were some known lower bounds or conjecture lower bounds? Yeah, so, there, so the, I think the most interesting, so, so first of all, there is a very recent paper on archive, which I've not really got into, where they, they claim to prove an n log n lower bound for the Boolean circuit complexity conditional on some conjecture in network coding theory, which I know nothing about, and I don't know. I don't know if this paper is, is good or not. Um, there is, um, there is. The, I think the, the the most convincing result I know is for the problem of online integer multiplication. What, so what that means is um, I give you the bits of the two numbers. So starting from the, the, the lowest bit, 
I give them to you one at a time, and you have to give me the output as soon as you know those bits up to that point. So like, once I tell you that the, the input's mod 16, you have to tell me the product mod 16. Then I reveal the integers mod 32, you have to tell me the product mod 32. So in a, in a Turing model with that online property, there is, a, there is a, a, an n log n average case lower bound, something like that. Um, but that's a pretty severe restriction, and we don't know, so we don't know n log n algorithms for that problem. We're pretty close, but not actually n log n. So that's about the best, the best result I'm aware of. There, there also, there's a result about uh, something, I think the guy's name is Morgan Stern, perhaps. So there's a, a lower bound for computing unnormalized complex discrete Fourier transforms, assuming that all the constants you use in your algorithm are bounded, which is the case for all the Fourier transform algorithms we know, but maybe not for all possible algorithms. So then there's an n log n bound, but there's a normalization factor in it. I don't know if it's very convincing. Um, yeah, there's not a whole lot. Any other questions or comments? All right, then let's oh, thank this. Yep. Oh, yep. yes, one kind of historical question. Do you think that that flurry of work in the 50s and 60s would have happened with Kolmogorov? With Kolmogorov hadn't made the conjecture. Yeah. No, absolutely. And it's very interesting, the story. So what happened is um, Kolmogorov had this conjecture, I think, floating around in his head for a few years. And he actually organized a seminar series, I think in, in Moscow, um, in about 19, must have been 1960, 61, 1960, I think. And um, he basically invited all the, all the brightest people around to come and work on this conjecture and other related conjectures. And I mean, even, even the idea of conjecturing a lower bound was still pretty new in those days, right? Like they didn't, I don't think they really had very good formal models of computation yet. So you can't, you can't, even, you can't even state a lower bound without a formal model. Um, so what happened is Karatsuba was a student in the audience at this, at, this, at this seminar series. And I think after the first week or two, then you know, Kolmogorov had told the audience about his conjecture and, 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 and Karatsuba was like, hey, but what if you do this? And uh, Kolmogorov was like, um, and basically shut down the seminar series as a result. And then I think what happened is Kolmogorov um, published, he, he, he wrote the paper and he submitted it under the names of Karatsuba and, uh, and someone else, Hoffman. Um, like this, maybe there's two different papers, I have to check this. Um, and, and it got published, and then Karatsuka didn't know about it until he got sent <laughs> copies of the published paper. Um, so, you know, Kolmogorov wasn't claiming it for himself, but still, I, I think that's something that wouldn't happen these days. It's <laughs> interesting, interesting story, anyway. All right, no more. Well, then let's thank David.